All right. Should be good to go. We're now streaming on Facebook. So I will go ahead and get us kicked off here. Welcome everybody to season five now of our webinar series. We're just saying that uh, there might be some webinar fatigue, but I don't think the desire or the passion for knowledge in the soil health industry has really slowed down or died at all. In fact, I think more people are eager to learn what they can do to improve the profitability of their farm and improve the health of their soil. So we did bring in a, a big gun here for this first one to kick things off. We wanted to find somebody that had experience in the field. Um, this webinar series, we've got a lot of really, really smart individuals, some doctors, um, all kinds of things, but we wanted somebody that actually had experience and knew what they were doing, uh, as well as the knowledge. <laughs> Uh, Jimmy, I don't think you're a PhD, but you've definitely got the skill set and the knowledge to do that if you want. So we wanted to start off with somebody that was really got their hands dirty. So we got Jimmy Emmons with us this evening. Um, for those who are tuned in, if this is your first time, you guys are going to be muted. But if you have any questions or anything you want to put in the chat box, we're going to let Keith and Jimmy kind of have a discussion tonight. This isn't necessarily a presentation. But if you have questions during the interview with Keith and Jimmy, you can type those out in the chat bar or in the Q&A. And we'll go till about 6.15 with the interview portion and then we'll open it up to audience questions. So we'll definitely get to those. Um, with that, I will put myself on mute, go to the background. And Keith, do you wanna go ahead and introduce our speaker? Yeah, thanks Noah. And uh, thanks everyone for joining us. It's uh, a little, it's going to take us a little bit to get into the rhythm of this again, but I am excited, uh, like Noah said, to be able to kick this off with uh, my good friend Jimmy Emmons. Uh, Jimmy, we go back many years, uh, really, uh, I don't know, broad, for, I think as long as we've had green cover seed, it feels like that we've known you and that we've worked with you uh, through no-till on the plains and through different events. Uh, so Jimmy is a farmer and rancher from Western Oklahoma, and we'll talk a little bit about where he's at and uh, what kind of makes that unique because the, his ability to make it work where he's at uh, is even more impressive than uh, where a lot of us are at. So uh, like Noah said, we wanted Jimmy on here because he brings really unique perspective uh, because he's been doing these things for a number of years. Uh, in, in the cropping side, which is important, uh, in the livestock side, so he's definitely been uh, integrating the livestock. Uh, but the other thing that I really like with what Jimmy has been doing is that he's, he's very, very uh, concerned about getting the message out. So he, he speaks widely across the country, uh, even into other countries. Uh, and he's, he's a real public servant at heart as well. Uh, he's he served on a lot of different commissions and boards and uh, leadership positions within conservation movements. So in my opinion, that gives him additional perspective and experience uh, as he approaches a lot of this, because he's seen these concepts and these principles work, not just on his own farm, which is important, but he's also seen it work across farms all across the country. And then he's able to bring a lot of that information in and share it. So, Jimmy, I'm, uh, I, I am uh, excited to have you here on the webinar. I'm even more excited to be able to call you a friend, uh, to be able to call you a, a partner in this venture that we call Soil Health and Regenerative Ag. And that's kind of how I want to kick this uh, webinar off. You know, regenerative ag is kind of a hot buzzword. You know, we, we started out kind of no-till and soil health and now regenerative ag is, is kind of, it seems like it's settled in as, as kind of the term that a lot of people use. We use it here, uh, but I'm not sure that everybody really understands exactly what regenerative ag means, and it may mean different things to different people. So I'm curious from your background, your experience uh, from everything that you're doing, what does regenerative agriculture mean to you? And how are you employing that or how are you uh, practicing that on your farming operation there in Western Oklahoma? Well, good evening, Keith, and, and thanks for the invitation. Um, yeah, you know, like you said, when we started 10, 11 years ago, uh, it, we've done a lot of talking about soil health and cover crops and no-till. And then this term regenerative ag came along and it, and it really fit 
it fits me because we talk quite a lot about how we degraded the resource, the, the soil, and for to regenerate it, to rebuild it, to restore it uh, is really what we're after. And, and it really fits uh, what we're trying to do is, is to build the organic matter and the carbon uh, levels back up where it was, you know, hopefully pre-settlement uh, and, and get back to where it was the dark, rich uh, soil that it once was in the prairie. So, you know, we, uh, we, we really like that term in Emmons Farms because I think it fits, like I said, uh, what we're trying to do. And it, it is very popular right now and a very big buzzwords uh, across the country. Uh, I done a podcast the other day and they were Googling up uh, terms that we might uh, name the podcast. Regenerative Ag had come up 127,000 times in the last three days on Google. Yeah. So uh, people are watching and, and trying to learn and, and get that buzzword out. Uh, but like I said, I think it really fits what you and I are doing on our own farms and land. And, and that's uh, trying to rebuild and restore uh, what was once a very productive uh, prairie ecosystems. So I, I like that term. Yeah, and you know, our, our mission statement here at, at Green Cover, you see it on the little board here behind me, but it's, you know, it's, it's helping people regenerate God's creation for future generations. And, and that's one of the reasons that, you know, we feel such a, a kinship with you because I know that's a, a big passion of yours as well. Uh, Jimmy, I remember being at a field day uh, at, at your place and we were riding on the bus I can't remember if it was you telling the story or if it was one of the old farmers that were on there. But but talk about, you know, when we think about Western Oklahoma in particular, we think about soil that's just, just red. But I, and I said, I can't remember if it was you or somebody else, but you, you heard some of the old timers talk about when they first started farming that, it wasn't red. No, uh, you know, my great granddad, when he brought granddad uh, to the farm in 1926 talked about the grass being shoulder high and he was six foot four uh, down at the farm where where you've been when my pivots in the South Canadian River being there uh, and it was a very dark rich soil uh, underneath that then and you know that's that hadn't been that long ago when you really put it in uh, history perspectives and time frames and we had a field day today where we talked about the redness of the soil and really the reason it's red is because we washed everything else out from it uh, and the iron it just will not wash out with the other minerals and so it stays and gives us that red cast but we're we're finding now on our farm uh, we've been able to re reload re regenerate that and so uh, they've actually reclassified some of our soils in them first projects uh, because of the, the, the amount of carbon that we've been able to put back in to change the darkening of the soil. So I, I truly believe we're gonna get back uh, to where we were. It's, it's a slow uphill battle mm -hmm. and mother nature can help you or it can uh, tell you to wait a little bit uh, due to rains. When, when we do have them good years, we can make some really good, uh, you know, gains. But then in drought years, it's it's slower. You kind of erode a little of that away. But that's kind of the ebb and flow, and and I believe that's the way God created to, to not all always be the Garden of Eden. You know, you got to have some trials and tribulations as you go through to make you stronger. And so I I, I believe we're on the right course. Yeah. Yeah, and and I don't want to gloss over something that you said there, because it's it's a really big deal, in the fact that the the government has come out and reclassified your soil. So so not only did you just increase the soil organic matter, but to such an extent that when they look in their soil survey book and then they look at your soil, it's like this isn't the same thing that it was. You know, when did they do that in the 40s or 50s or whenever they did that 30s and, and, and Dave Brandt, you know, has done similar things. They've had to come out and just physically reclassify the soil because it is just not the same classification anymore. And that's such a big deal because 
the 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 not only has the color changed, but the productivity has changed as well. And you know, in in today's farming economy of tight margins and higher inputs and all of that, you know that that additional levels of productivity is is just really going to pay big dividends for you. Oh yeah, it's it's allowed us to really really cut back on uh, our commercial fertilizer that we put on uh, and our chemicals and weed control uh, has all, you know, probably if I've added that all up with my fuel bill, probably around 330 to 40,000 a year that we've cut out that we used to spend annually. And, and really for me, Keith, the, the, the sweetness of that itself is that Dave Brandt is the guy that, that made the light go on for me. Uh, 11 years ago as I heard him speak and I was like man I want to be Dave Branch you know and I want to I want to do that to my soil mm -hmm. and uh, it really shocked me uh, this past fall when the, the NRCS soil scientist and the commission soil scientist said you know over the past 10 years you've changed just so much that we can now reclassify that and I, I was like wait a minute wait a minute I can't, <laughs> What did you say? And uh, it, it really uh, is a very fulfilling moment uh, for us on the farm that, that we have accomplished a small milestone. We're not near Dave's level, do not get me wrong, uh, but we have been recognized that, that we can do that in a pretty in environment, uh, yeah. tough environment, so. Yeah, it, it definitely is a tough environment. So. Some of the some of the ways that you've gotten there, Jimmy, is you know I think your path to where you're at is somewhat similar to ours. You know we all kind of came out of more of a conventional mindset. You know maybe not full blown tillage, but certainly you know tillage was part of the operation. And then you know you like us, you know switched to no till initially because that just made a lot of sense. And you know, the, you know, we studied under Dwayne Beck, if you will, and just learned all those no-till concepts. And then, and then the cover crops started coming in and yeah, that made sense to add that in there too. And then I would say kind of the next stage of where we're at, and I know where you're at as well, is starting to bring in more of the biology, uh, whether it's uh, biological uh, additives or more importantly, just farming in such a way that increases the biology that we already have there. Talk, talk a little bit about your progression of how you've gone through those different steps. And, and then maybe let's have a little bit of a conversation about how much faster can people get there today if they employ the whole system at once instead of kind of piecemeal, like, like the steps that you and I have gone through. Yeah, and, and the, the, the great thing what we can do today is we have such avenues like right now uh, that we can learn from. Uh, through webinars and, and conferences and stuff that are predominant across the country and across the globe and probably worked that, that many, uh, you know, 10, 15 years ago, uh, and especially not at the level. So, you know, we started no-till in 1995, and uh, we had a lot to learn. Uh, and, and once again, that, that spot between my two ears uh, was pretty hard to change, and, and especially for my dad, my mother, uh, it was extremely hard because it just seemed all wrong. Yeah, you know, what what you were taught growing up. But you know, I liked the concept. I I, I thought it would work, and and we really struggled uh, five six years in uh, because we were still on the old mindset that you know residue was not our friend. We we still wanted to get rid of that for some reason. Uh, and then we started seeing things decline. And now I know what, what was going on. I wasn't feeding it enough. I wasn't keeping a living root growing uh, as long as I could. And, you know, all the principles. Uh, but once uh, that light came on with Dave and, and I was all in and we started to cover crops uh, and we started seeing benefits right away. And we were tracking very hard because once again, I had to be convinced myself that they weren't going to use too much water uh, in our arid environment. And, you know, that everybody was telling us, you know, you, you can't do that. That's double cropping. We can't double crop in Western Oklahoma. We barely got enough water uh, to, to raise one. And that's all true. Uh, now that I know that our infiltration rates were destroyed, 
uh, even though we were getting enough water, we weren't retaining enough water. Mm -hmm. And once we started with the cover crops, that started rebuilding and we started retaining more. And then that allows you to grow a cover crop that allows you to do some uh, limited double cropping systems uh, when, when there is extra moisture. And so, you know, our new motto now is uh, we want every raindrop where it falls. And when it rains, uh, I like to say we, we got it all. Uh, and, you know, in, a, in extreme weather, and we, we may have one of them tonight, uh, we're under the gun here uh, tonight for severe storms and, and heavy rainfall. We're, you know, I'm not saying we can take in a, a flood, but we can take in six to seven inches an hour uh, pretty quick. Uh, so we can uh, take a pretty heavy, moderate thunderstorm and take it all in. And if that persists, we, we may shed off some, but we're going to retain the most of it. And I think that's really key to use that down the road. So the, the whole reclassification of the soil uh, just shows that our water infiltration rates have really, really went up from a half inch an hour. So like I said, we've, we've measured anywhere from three to nine, 10 inches an hour. So we kind of settled with an average about six to seven, eight, somewhere in there. It depends on, in the soil type of where you're at. Mm -hmm. uh, but what a significant change in 10 years uh, to do that. And like you said, we started out no-till uh, in 95. We, we went to cover crops in 2010. Uh, then my soil scientist, he, he told the story today. He called me every day for 20 days straight, trying to convince me to, to go into rotational grazing uh, of the cover crops. And on the 21st day, uh, I agreed and, and we, we went into that. And uh, that's when I saw my soil changed the most, the quickest. Uh, and that kind of completed the ring of the circles, what I like to say. And, uh, and yes, if, if I could have started in 95, just whole hog all the way in, no-till, cover crops and animals, uh, and all that diversity and rotation, uh, there's no telling, I may be giving Dave, you know, a run for his money uh, down the stretch here. But, uh, we didn't, and you know, we learned a lot as we went, and uh, you, you can't discount that. Uh, I told them today again that uh, you learn uh, as you go from failures. You got to have some failures, and, and trust me, we've we've had plenty, just like uh, everybody else. And I'm not afraid to admit that I do some stupid things once in a while and try something that just flat dab doesn't work, but. Normally, I learn something from that that really helps me uh, try to do something next. So, it's uh, been a been a fun deal, and side-by-side -side comparisons in the field uh, really helps you learn. Yeah, I, I I love the I love the the saying, and and I had somebody in California tell me this once too. And somebody asked, "How much rain did you get?" The only answer that we should ever give is all of it. Yeah. And, you know, if we can't say all of it, then it doesn't really matter how much you got. It's how much you get in. Now, again, I've been out to your farm there in Levy, you know, Dewey County. It, it's a tough environment. You know, nobody's, nobody's going to deny that. And even here where we're at in south central Nebraska, people still, uh, you know, they don't want to plant a cover crop because of the moisture that it's going to use. And, you know, we've done a number of moisture experiments to have to prove it to ourselves. And I know that you did too. Share with the group a little bit about what you did to prove to yourself that the moisture usage was maybe not as big of a concern as what you had initially thought. Uh, just, just share a little bit about that experiment that you did that year out in that wheat stubble field. Yeah, so we, we harvested wheat and... Uh we decided that we wanted to measure what a cover crop would would use. And uh, so we put moisture probes, temperature probes in, but we also went and made a plot uh, where we took all the residue off and kept it bare, just like the neighbors and just like I would have done uh, growing up, no residue, no weeds, no living roots. And so we put a probe and a temperature probe and a moisture probe there and then one in the cover crops. And uh, what, we, what we've really found was that 
we we actually were evaporating more with that bare soil in our arid environment than a cover crop could ever use. And uh, so as we took them probes all fall going into the wheat planting, we showed that we had a significant increase uh, of available water in the profile where the cover crop was, and, and we had none uh, in that square. It was like a real eye opener to, to us, and I knew I was on the right path. And so we started the learning uh, in our mind, you know, what the systems approach would do and, and how the plants shaded uh, and how that mix of uh, different things worked in synergy together and that the, the biology started coming back alive. And we thought, man, we're really on to something. Then the, the big breakthrough came through the next spring. We went ahead, uh, we terminated that. And this was in 2011, mind you. And we had, uh, uh, I think it was 9.3 inches of moisture in, in 11 and in 12, we had a 7.2. And then in 14, we had 25.3 the month of May. Uh, and that's the reason I tell everybody uh, when they ask me what kind of rainfall area you live in, I said it's a 22 inch rainfall, give or take 22 inches. <laughs> and and, and it's, it's, it's the truth. But what we really found the next spring when the Noble Research, Jim Johnson came out to the farm, it's kind of like you do once in a while come by to visit. We went up there and you could see that square uh, still in the wheat and the wheat wasn't as good in that square that was bare that year and the wheat around it was better. Now, once again, we had limited rainfall, so it wasn't, it wasn't 100 bushel wheat. It, it, you know, 25 bushel wheat was all uh, that was there. But Jim got a probe out, a soil probe, and uh, went to probing around, and he hit uh, a hard layer in that plot uh, that was bare. He said, man, you've got a restriction down there. Well, when he really pulled it out, it was dry dirt at 16 inches. And uh, I said, well, Jim, you know, it just hadn't rained that much. Well, when he moved outside that square in where the cover crops was, he could push it all the way in. And, and it was 33 and a half inches to a dry layer there. And, and that sealed the deal is what I tell everybody. Uh, we knew right then that that proved uh, beyond a shadow of a doubt uh, for me that we had to keep it covered and, and keep that principle in. Uh, then the next step was uh, the following year, we done the same thing, uh, but we grazed that cover crop instead of uh, terminating it. And uh, we didn't wind up with quite as much moisture, but we understood because we grazed it longer and it went to, to more reproductive mode that we used a little bit more water. But then the following February, when we measured, once we'd caught a little rain and a little snow through the winter, we were actually water ahead in them plots versus the, the bare spot. And once again, our water infiltration was getting better, our aggregation was growing. And, and that, that really sealed the deal that, we, yeah, we, now we understand if we graze it, we're gonna use some water, but we're still improving the soil at a more rapid pace. And we're actually going to be water ahead down the stretch when the crop really needs it uh, to finish and make grain. Uh, we had the water available. Uh, but once again, it, God does have to provide the rain uh, in that period. Or, or if it never rains, it's, it's really never going to matter. Uh, but it always seems to rain. And, and we need to catch all of it. Yeah. We really do. Yeah, that, that's for sure. And, and I think what you were seeing and what, what you were measuring is, is similar to what we saw and what we measured here. I know I've seen slides from Dwayne Beck that he's shown very similar things in South Dakota. Uh, Jay Fuhr, you know, has almost exactly the same type of results from some of the North Dakota guys up there. You know, that the, that the moisture that a cover crop uses is generally almost all offset and sometimes even gain back more because of less evaporation and better infiltration. And so, you know, moisture certainly is going to be a limiting factor, but it's, it's a lot of times not as limiting. Uh, 
it, it doesn't have to be as limiting as what we think it is, but sometimes we make it more limiting through tillage or through the removal of residue. And, and we saw the same thing, you know, just because there's nothing growing out there does not mean that that soil, that, that piece of ground is not losing moisture through that evaporation process. Uh, and, and another thing that, that I said in a field day, and we're in Southern Oklahoma uh, today, and uh, we were out in a pasture and had a lot of rag, ragweeds and mare's tail sticking up. And they were talking about the canopy and it really wasn't that bad. Um, and they were talking about maybe mowing it up, you know, above the grass, just knock them weeds off. And I said, where I come from, that's a perfect snow catch. Uh, and, and from from really my place, uh, clear up to in the Canada is, we all think about snow catch and, and we want, once again, every drop. Uh, and so, you know, even them covers uh, in that wheat stubble, in that wheat that we're growing, really helps us catch that snow in the winter time. So, you know, that's, we, we want that moisture and we need it. And it's being provided, we just gotta be a good steward and, and uh, try to keep it where it falls. Yeah, especially when your neighbors are kind enough to do all that tillage and then just give you all their snow for free if you could catch it. Yeah. And so, so yeah, I, that's that's a big deal. You know, I've I've had to go dig my, my neighbors out because their fields block the roads and, and they, they talk about how it didn't snow quite as much or blow quite as bad over my place. So I said, <laughs> no, 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 it didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Stayed right where it needed to be. So because of what you saw with the moisture and, you know, that it, it, it was working differently than what, you know, we maybe inherently think, you know, coming from that conventional mindset, uh, talk a little bit about some of the other things then that you were able to build on that, like uh, some of the, you know, growing grain sorghum with some companion crops and maybe even some of the double cropping stuff that you've done, which is completely unheard of in your area. Yeah, you know. Once you start down this path and and you see something work, then you want to do more and and it's kind of like building a race car. Once you win your first race, you you, you want to build it a little better, a little faster. And uh, so then we start talking about companion cropping. So you know, if I'm going to go uh, travel America and travel the world and, and talk about this, you got to practice what you preach and. Uh, and, and I'm no false prophet. I, I really try to, to, to practice what I preach. And so, like, okay, grain sorghum. If we're going to raise grain sorghum, this, this terrible plague of sugarcane aphids was, was really, uh, really hurting the grain sorghum in our area and clear up. You know, even in north of me. Uh, so we uh, come up with this idea with you and your team of how we could put some of the plants in that and use some different colored flowers and, uh, you know, try to attract the beneficials. And uh, so we've done that. And uh, lo and behold, uh, we didn't have to spray. And we see that every year. We might have a few for a little bit. Uh, then we have the predators come in and, and just really take care of them. Um, and so it was a real eye. Once again, we're saving money. Uh, because the seed never cost as much as one chemical pass uh, cost, uh, especially in that where we're just using five or six companions uh, with the grain sorghum. It's a pretty cheap uh, mix to put in. Uh, and we, we really saw some great benefits from that. We continue to do that uh, even this year. And I also just right south of my grain sorghum this time, I had a, a couple of BMRs uh, planted with some flax and some buckwheat in there as well for hay. And uh, when I went to uh, swath that, the, the blister beetles uh, were just by the billions in, in there. And so I stopped and got out and the sugarcane aphids had come in uh, and was in that, that BMRs uh, that we foraged that we had. And so I just let them work a couple of days uh, and they eliminated the problem uh, and they moved on. I don't know where the beetles went, but they moved on. And then we were able to cut and put that hay up. And uh, 
So Mother Nature has this really good system. If we don't mess with it a little bit, just give her a little bit of time. Um, and then uh, also uh, this year we had some sesame growing. And it, these were double crop uh, as well as that grain sorghum. So the, the grain sorghum was behind uh, barley and the, the sesame was behind uh, wheat. And so we were late planting. It, it, this year was another challenging year, uh, but we got we got good stand, excellent stand of sesame. It was growing real good. And the company I was growing it for, Sesco, called me and said, man, we're having a bad infestation of, of worms coming in and you really need to be watching. And I told them, I said, well, I, I put some humates over the top and some a product called HyperGrow as well as a pretty good shot of molasses uh, the other day. And I think we're good. And he just kind of laughed at me and he said, well, I'll be out check for worms and uh you know one week went by two weeks went by every week he would come and he's like man the, the worms just aren't coming and it's like yeah I, I know that our bricks levelers is staying uh between 12 13 14 uh during the day and i think that's taken care of them because they just can't digest the sugars and he looked at me and he said jimmy do you really think that's helping and I said, well, really, did you, how many worms did you find? And he said, well, none. And I said, well, then do you really have to ask me, you know, is this working? I, I really truly believe that, that that's a good deterrent. And we never did have to spray. And we're going to harvest a really good crop of sesame uh, for the year here. Uh, how, how, how many visits did he have to make to your field? <laughs> Before he finally stopped asking you if you really thought that was making a difference. And he came six weeks uh, pretty <laughs> religiously. Uh, and he's doing his job for the company uh, because they were having worm issues. And, and so now they're really interested uh, in looking at that and seeing, you know, maybe doing some more trials. And I told him I would, I would be sure be uh, happy to help with that. Um, but once again, it's that holistic uh, total uh, ecosystem circle uh, that if you allow it and, and you put the diversity in and it, also in that sesame, we've got sweet clover growing as a, a relay. So uh, we, we planted that together uh, at the same time and uh, we'll harvest that sesame here in the next few weeks and then uh, that clover will overwinter and then hopefully we'll have a harvest of clover seed uh, next year uh, during harvest period is, is the goal so to do one planting and, and have two harvests in a relay. So, you know, not only we're, we, have we been doing companions, uh, we're trying this new relay thing. And, and you know, we've got to watch it in Western Oklahoma where we're at the 20 inch rainfall, uh, how much we can push the system. But once again, uh, if you get it all, uh, 20 inches is enough to do some of this. Uh, and if you really put it in perspective and you understand that 10 years ago, we were just taking a half inch uh, water infiltration rate. So if we got three or four inches, you know, we really only got three and a half inches. Uh, and so, you know, if you can really catch it all, your opportunities are so much greater uh, to work with. And I think that's an obstacle in our own minds out there that, that to understand how, how the system works and how important uh, water infiltration, water evaporation, transevaporation, and all that works together uh, and how the synergy of, of growing multiple things at one time uh, really benefits the system. <clears throat> yeah, and you were, you know, so speaking of the whole moisture thing, we were having a conversation uh, the other day that I found completely fascinating as well. And I wanted you to share that with when you were out digging in your fields and you noticed there was more moisture, you know, where you had these really biologically active soils. Just to tell people a little bit about what you were seeing there and that you really didn't understand what was happening uh, until uh, you brought this up to Dr. Chris Nichols. Yeah, you know, in our moisture probes, it was Voss, uh, myself, and Russell Hedrick uh, in North Carolina all were talking at a conference one day about, you know, 
support. I, I've been noticing a little uptick in our moisture here in the spring and it's not raining and it's not coming from below because we got 40 inch probes in. Um, and it's not a lot of moisture, don't get me wrong now. It's, it's a few hundreds, uh, a little at a time, but it is enough to measure. And we, we just couldn't come up with any strategy or ideas what it was and just so happened, uh, Dr. Chris Nichols uh, came by and sat down with us and was visiting and we throwed that out and said, I guess you, you probably know what's happening. And she, she looked at us, she said, actually I do. He said, uh, you know, what do you uh, respire out your mouth uh, the most? And, and all of us said, you know, CO2. And she said, no, it's water vapor. And so the, the more active your system is, once again, they're just like us. They breathe in oxygen, they exhale CO2 and water vapor. So the more of them that are working for you down there, the more that they're exhaling. And of course, the more water they have to work in, the more of them that can work, the more active the system gets to going. And uh, so you, you can really see that. And then this summer, I had the distinct privilege to be back uh, in North Dakota with Jay Fuhr at Minoka Farm and do a conference with them. And Jay was putting some biologicals in furrow on the seed uh, and then in furrow and on the seed. And he actually had checked areas just like we all do uh, beside it. And you could push a shovel in in the check area right by the corn plant, uh, maybe four inches uh, where it was seed applied, maybe uh, six, seven inches. Uh, and then where he had in furrow about a gallon, gallon and a half uh, of that worm cast, uh, plus on the seed, uh, you could almost push a, a sharpshooter completely in. That was just with one hand, no, no feet. And it just shows the biological activity. And, and it's like, wow, we, we saw that in Oklahoma. And uh, then I reached out to my friend, Michael Thompson, and he was seeing the same thing. Uh, so, you know, we, we can really create uh, some moisture through the family below as well. And uh, so, you know, give it the opportunity. Uh, it can really show you what it can be possible. And, and in them dry periods, uh, it's the difference uh, from making a crop and not making a crop. And I know that y'all saw uh, uh, extreme weather this year and you and I were talking about the corn harvest uh, up there was still pretty good on the dry land this year. It may be exceptional, uh, even in dry periods. And, and I, I'm telling you, I, I truly believe that that's what you're experiencing. Uh, your system was active enough that uh, a little dab of water can go a long ways uh, at, at the most critical time. That, that's, that's a real mind blowing paradigm shift to think about the biology actually creating, you know, its own moisture and how that, the, how, how all that works together. Super exciting. I want to, I want to shift gears just a little bit here, Jimmy, before we uh, go to question and answers with folks, but uh, in, I know you're no longer doing this, uh, but uh, during the Trump administration, you uh, served well, honorably in, in the USDA, uh, worked under Undersecretary Northey, uh, you know, to be basically be an advocate for farmers and ranchers, uh, you know, with the different programs. And so you had a lot of experience with that. You're no longer doing that, uh, but you're still doing some, some pretty darn exciting things, uh, not necessarily as a government employee, but working with some programs that could really, really uh, bring some great benefits uh, to all of us as producers. I want to. I would just want you to take a little bit of time and kind of explain, uh, share a little bit about this uh, most current project that you're working on because I find it super exciting. Well, I'm 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 actually working on two right now at, at one time, and the first one I'm going to talk about is NACD, the National Association of Conservation Districts. I'm serving on their Climate Action uh, Task Force, uh, where we wrote uh, a a op-ed. Uh, to the secretary and to the administration of what we think uh, farmers can do uh, with this cover crops and soil health projects and to regenerate the soil, which is very, very exciting. This producers, uh, 
and and a lot smarter people than I am on that committee as well, PhDs and people across the country. Uh, so I'm, I'm really happy to be a part of that. The next project that, that I'm really excited about as well is called RIPE, and that's R-I-P-E, and it, it stands for Real Investment to Protect Our Environment. And, you know, for a producer, that sounds uh, kind of odd name, uh, but it's a bunch of producers that's got together. And uh, we think that, uh, you know, we should be paid uh, to do good practices. And I think it's a great opportunity uh, if we get it funded and built right. And we're in the middle of building this right, right now uh, where we have the data that says if you do cover crops, the ecosystem's benefits to uh, someone that's uh, not in agriculture, the, the, the public uh, exceeds, uh, you know, over $100, $150 an acre. And some of them practices is three and $400 an acre for his water quality and, and whatnot. So if a producer uh, would sign up in this program once we get it built and funded, and we don't have it funded yet, uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute, uh, that he would be paid $100 an acre. And that would help him uh, pay the cost of a cover crop seed uh, to, to do no-till, uh, to put it in. But then the benefit to that uh, far exceeds that $100 payment uh, in ecosystems benefits. So we, we've got a bunch of practices that we have the data. Uh, we're now putting in grazing, uh, amp grazing, rotational grazing. Uh, in that as well. Uh, so we have a lot of projects uh, and programs that are practices that, that has that data behind it that will really help us. And so then the next step, once we get that, uh, is to go to, to you know, our funders in DC and, and show them that, you know, you're really talking about what uh, producers can do for the environment here at Climate Action. Uh, and this is what we can do. And, and this is what we think uh, it's worth to a producer to do it. I really truly believe, Keith, you know, if you really look at the numbers and I know you look at the cover crop seed business numbers and we've grown over the past year since you started, you and Brian there. Uh, but when you really look at the big percentage numbers, we're not as uh, far as adaptation across the country near where we need to be. Uh, in, in no-till or covers or the systems approach. So I really truly believe if we get this built and get it funded uh, and, and let USDA work the way it should, uh, I think the next big percentage uh, is there and available for us to get. And it will help people because, you know, quite truthfully in these really tough economic times, uh, it's hard to cash flow uh, operations anyhow and uh, lending institutions and all are watching very carefully. Uh, but, you know, if you could tell them I could collect $100 an acre here uh, to do this, uh, I think the lending institutions will be behind it as well. And I really think that's another step that we need to for them to understand the benefits of a, a, a complete systems approach to cropping and, and grazing across America. So I'm really excited about that. We're going to talk a lot about that uh, at your conference in Iola uh, this December as well. Uh, so I'm excited about that. There's lots of support, uh, a lot of producers that's on the board. I'm on the steering committee uh, for that RIPE as well. And, and so lots of organizations uh, uh, across the country are joining as well. Yeah, and, and I know that you and, and other members of the steering committee are going to be out promoting this, uh, helping answer questions. I think Noah's got a slide that he'll pull up here in just a second, kind of showing people where you'll be if they want to visit more with you about this. But one, one comment that I want to make on this, this program, why it excites me so much, you know, carbon sequestration is kind of the sexy term right now. Everybody seems like everybody's coming out with their own carbon program. And there, there's probably going to be some good ones. I, I just don't know where they all land yet. But there's so many more benefits to, to the system than just carbon. And so what I really like about what you guys are doing is that you're not, you're not just getting fixated on carbon as the only benefit that comes from this. You're looking at it more from a, 
from a whole systems approach. And that, to me, that's exciting because there, there's so much more benefit than carbon. And, and to not only be able to reward the producer for that, but to let the consumer know, to let the general public know that, hey, these practices are really helping my water. They're really helping my air quality. There's just so many other benefits. And so I really appreciate uh, that bigger picture approach to what you guys are doing. Noah, do you have, uh, you want to pull up that slide there showing people where uh, Jimmy's going to be at here to be talking more about this program? Yeah, and, and while I do that here, Jimmy, if you want to kind of go over where you'll be, um, I am going to open it up to questions here. So if you guys have anything, feel free to type that out in the chat bar or in the Q&A. And uh, Jimmy can get to those in a second. But first, nope, this is the wrong one. Let me get to. Yeah, we'll be traveling a lot, Noah, over the next several months. Um, I'm going to Greeley, Colorado uh, next week. Uh, at the Greeley uh, Symposium there at the West Greeley Conservation District for a couple of days. I'm really excited about that. Um, I'm going to be going to Iola uh, as well, green cover. I don't see that all in front of me, so I'm, so I'm reading that off my, <laughs> my well, All mind. I can say, Jimmy, is it's sure good that you've got an uh, understanding and a hardworking wife and a great hand in Carson there, because I don't know that you're ever home to hard to do any work, are you? Well, and they say I'm not there to mess things up either and try something. <laughs> I, I am very blessed to, to be traveling a lot uh, this year. I'm, I know I'm going to uh, be in Kentucky at the National No-Till as well. I'm going to be uh, in Delaware. I'm going to be in uh, Utah. I'm going to be in Idaho, uh, Colorado, uh, Kansas. Uh, and lots of other places as well. Booked another deal in Missouri today, uh, falling no till on the plains in, in uh, January. So uh, lots of travel, lots of conferences. Uh, and, and, you know, the, 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 the thing that I really enjoy most, and I know you do as well, Keith, is I typically learn a lot more than, than you know, people think I go to teach and share and, and uh show people what we've done, but I, I always bring home more. I'm always yeah. blessed more than, than I think I share. So uh, it's, it's real rewarding. I meet lots of people uh, in the arid environments To I got people I work with in six inch rainfall and 60 inch rainfall, and it works everywhere. Just like you and I were talking earlier. Uh, it's just how you apply them principles mm -hmm. uh, in their local environments. Yeah. So Right before we get to questions here, uh, Jimmy was mentioning he's going to be at our conference we're putting on in Iola at our Iola facility down there in southeast Kansas. Uh, that's going to be the middle of December. I think it's December 15th and 16th. Jimmy's going to be uh, one of our keynote speakers. Uh, so he'll be sharing more of his story and of his experiences is in, in that regenerative ag journey, uh, as well as he'll be there representing that this RIPE program. So, you know, if you can come to this, uh, it's going to be a great time. We'll be getting more information out to everybody about that uh, here soon. But that's going to be uh, the middle of December. So we're it's the day after rifle hunting season for deer ends in Kansas because we don't want to try to compete against the deer stand. Uh, the next day, then you just come on over and learn about soil health down there in, in southeast Kansas. So, uh, Noah, do you want to go ahead and go to some questions here? Yep. Let me... Get out of sharing my screen. We actually could never see the screen being shared. Oh, well, that would have been good to know. <laughs> I thought you knew that. <laughs> no, I had it on the same screen I did when we practiced. So uh, we, we, saw, we saw your beautiful smiling picture. That's funny. All right. Well, uh, we're going to start off. Edward asked about the reclassification of your soil. He's wondering what did it what did it start out as, and what did it end up being classified as? Are you just referring to the organic carbon, or uh, what was that, and what was the economic impact of your soils changing? So our soils in the in that South Canadian River uh, area is a very young soil. Uh, our state soil scientist Steve Allspaw talked about that today. Uh, 500 years or, or younger, uh, which for a soil is, is very, very young. 
uh, and normally in them uh, floodplain areas where them new soils are, uh, they're very low in organic matter, which which ours was uh, originally when they classified it. Uh, and so, and it Jimmy, was a, when you say low, you're talking less than one percent, probably, aren't you? Yes. So we had spots in the real sandy that was three tenths, four tenths wow. of percent. Um, so very, very low. Uh, most of all that uh, that was three or four tenths now is one to one point two. Uh, 1.3 is kind of what we measured the other day. Uh, the rest of the field uh, now is in the two and a half to three. We got a few threes in there, which is very exciting because that kind of gets us back to getting close to a, maybe where we were pre-settlement. Uh, most of Western Oklahoma was, they think, around 3%. Uh, percent. So that was, in. I should have looked that up. I, I hate the uh, to call the, the soil classification out, but I, but I want to say it was a, a, a used to flu vent uh, was, was the term. So it's very light in color. And now it's uh, turned into a mollic uh, haptosoil, uh, which is very dark. And uh, even the new soil scientists that came this, this summer uh, with Steve out there didn't think, uh, you know, that it could be changed that well. And when they looked at it, and I want to say the color number was a 24, uh, and it ha only had to be a 22 to, to be in that classification. So we're actually a little darker uh, than, than we thought. So, uh, and I could, if you'll send me an email or something, I could get Edward uh, more details uh, in specifics and the right, correct terminology on that. Uh, and, and what does that mean uh, in, in dollars? Uh, to us on Emmons Farms. Well, as we get that organic matter to grow, we, we know we got more water holding capacity, our aggregation's better, but we also have more nutrients uh, for that, you know, every 1% that we can grow, we have more in, we have more phosphorus in that that's readily available for us to take up. And so we don't have to spend uh, that money uh, to get that. So the benefits, uh, really come and, and that's my deal with the carbon markets. So, like you said, Keith, there, there are really lots of talk about that, uh, but we can see benefits from that carbon ourselves uh, in savings uh, uh, on our inputs and grow better crops with less money. So we're actually done seeing that. I'm in the carbon market business right now, I, and I, but I'm collecting it in grain and beef. Uh, it's, instead of somebody sending me a check. And, and there's nothing wrong with if somebody wants to sign up for a, a carbon and, and like the right project will allow that to be stacked. Uh, so you can do that as, as well. So uh, that's kind of where we're at, Edward. Like I said, if you need more specifics, uh, send me an email and I'll get them to you. While you brought up the, the right project, uh, Ron asked, is that available for us up here in Northwestern Ohio? So oh, it will be uh, everywhere once we get it in. It, it is not a program yet. Uh, we're in the building stages of that. Um, and you, you can go to the website. Uh, we're on uh, Twitter, on Facebook as well, and, and start looking at that. And like I said, we'll, we'll feature that at, at Iowa at several conferences. I know we're going to the National Grazing Lands Coalition, uh, and we're going to uh, uh, Commodity Classic. Uh, and so what we're doing right now is getting the practices in place that, that shows the benefits, uh, building the program, and then we'll go uh, seek funding from Congress to, to either put it in the farm bill or a standalone uh, a funding source to do that. Uh, we've proposed a 100 acre uh, and 100 farmers pilot project to show that it really works. Uh, and we're, we hope to get that up here in the next few months uh, as a pilot. But then uh, it, it won't restrict you to acres or producers once we get it fully funded. Okay. Uh, Randy was asking about the clover that you planted. Do you remember what rate you planted that at? I, I want to say that was about six to eight pounds uh, in there as well. Uh, 
get the green cover seed could look that up, but I, I think that's uh, that's kind of what we talked about in that five to six, seven uh, pounds per acre. Uh, and that's a, sweet, right. that's a sweet clover as well. Uh, and, and I was surprised. I, I didn't think we uh, had very much, uh, but it's really come on now as the canopy's opening up as the sesame is finishing. Uh, and so I, I think we got plenty uh, to, to grow a crop. Uh, we'll just see if uh, Mother Nature allows us to do that. And, and Jimmy, you talked a little bit about how there's significant different clover growth where the sesame was pretty good versus where it was pretty thin. And, you know, and that may cause some issues down the road, but it kind of shows you the resiliency that some of these things you know, they're, they're filling the niche when your cash crop isn't growing right, but yet it's not going to be over competitive when it does, does grow well. Yeah, it's, it stayed in the canopy like it was supposed to. Uh, it won't interfere with us harvesting at all. Uh, where we saw the sprayer run to, to put the humix and the, and the molasses on, it really opened the canopy up right there. And uh, that clover really took off and it, it, it was really showing what it can do. So I know it's there, it, it, and it, it will come on when we need it. Uh, and, and that's the thing about companions and relays. I tell everybody a companion is much like marriage. Uh, you know, you, you both can't dominate because uh, you, you will be fighting and fighting and fighting. You've got to complement one another, and a companion is, is just to complement the, the really cash crop that you're growing and to help it foster it along. And so I really like that term, companion. Okay, uh, Willie asks, in your experience, does it take longer to improve water infiltration in the typical Nebraska clay soil compared to a more balanced loamy soil under proper regenerative egg systems? You know, where, where we really see uh, soil that's not as degraded uh, we see a quicker turnaround. Uh, it, we have some really, and Keith's been on my place uh, where I live, uh, really upland that was farmed to death with cotton and heavy tillage. It's a slower process uh, in that heavily degraded area that really iron rich red soil. Uh, and so it's not going to turn around uh, as quick uh, but we're seeing significant change, uh, you know, increase in all that, just not as much as in that river bottom. And, and, and I've got some bottom land south of my house uh, that Keith's been on as well that has really turned around really quick. Uh, and so the better the soil, the, the more activity that you started with, uh, the family was there, you just had to foster it to grow. Uh, and then where you don't have anything, it's virtually a, a, almost a totally dead soil. It, it takes, you know, that three to five years uh, to really start seeing significant changes. Uh, but we are at, at over one to one and a half percent there at my, my farm at the house now. Uh, and for Western Oklahoma, that's pretty good. Yeah, and, and one other thing to consider there, and then Jimmy, you mentioned this too, that when you started rotationally grazing your animals, you saw that soil improve that much quicker. You know, you, you might consider those really degraded, almost dead soils like what you talked about. You may need to just throw more tools at it, including some biological amendments, including, you know, just growing cover crops for a couple of years and grazing them to get your income instead of trying to grow a cash crop, which likely is going to be marginal at best in those soils, you know, that might be a good one to consider going to, you know, a livestock based income stream for a year or two to really turn that around. Yeah, and, and we do apply uh, them, them biostimulants uh, on our crops. We, we, we really like the hyper grow on the soil stem and, and everything from Elevate Ag uh, has really uh, helped us along. And I think it, it will speed that process up because it facilitates the family to grow and foster quicker. Uh, and so we, we've really liked that. We don't mind spending a little bit of money on that uh, to, to feed that biology, to get it to grow and, and get things turned around a little quicker. You know, we all, we all want to get there quicker. Uh, mm -hmm. A living root and animals can do it. Uh, it's just gonna take a little bit longer. 
Keith, there's a question here you're talking about what kind of forbs you can plant to pull up some subsoil phosphorus in regards to mm -hmm. the cost of a lot of these inputs. How can we use cover crops to kind of alleviate that cost of synthetics? Yeah, I was just starting to type a response, but it's going to be easier just to talk <laughs> about it. You know, uh, Ken, there, there's a lot of different things you can use. The best one uh, for freeing up phosphorus in the soil is going to be buckwheat. Uh, buckwheat's roots have a very strong acid that it that creates that can convert the inorganic phosphorus that's in all of our soils to a plant available form. So buckwheat can get the phosphorus in your soil that your other crops are not going to touch. And then when that buckwheat dies and it decomposes, that phosphorus that's now in the buckwheat plant will cycle and become available for the next crop. Uh, so it's not really a deep-rooted form. It's a very fast-growing plant. You only need about six weeks to, to grow almost a complete full crop of buckwheat. So if you've got a place in your rotation where you can slip that in and, it, you know, buckwheat uh, tolerates heat really well. It does not tolerate cold weather. Uh, so like if you have a crop of wheat that you harvest and you can come in with a, a high rate of buckwheat as part of your cover crop, it will really help uh, uh, free up some phosphorus then for that next following crop. Uh, buckwheat was one of the things that Jimmy used as, in his companions with that grain sorghum, partially for the phosphorus solubilizing activity, but mainly because it, it starts blooming in 30 days and you can get a tremendous amount of insect attraction too. So uh, we like buckwheat and lots of our cover crop mixes, and those are just two of the reasons why. So buckwheat would be one of the things that I'd be looking at trying to get out there if you feel like uh, your soils are pretty low in phosphorus and you're not willing to spend the, the $1,000 a ton to put phosphorus out there, which most of us are not right now. is really expensive. So that'd be the first one I'd look at. All right. Um, I don't have any other questions here. We're, we're over 6.30, so I'll let you wrap up. Jimmy, thank you so much for your time. We appreciate it. Your experience and knowledge is, is highly valued. We did record this. We'll get it posted on YouTube here later this week. So if you guys are watching and either didn't take notes and you want to re-watch this or share with some friends, we'll get this posted later this week. Um, next week, we have Dr. Rick and Liz Haney that are going to be on with us. They're going to be talking about their regenerative story, what they see um, as far as not just soil testing. We're going to talk a little bit about that with the Haney test, but we also wanted to get their input on what they see regenerative agriculture looking like in the future. So we'll have them for next week. If you guys signed up for this one, we're going to automatically register you for that next week. So you don't have to worry about that, but um, we look forward to seeing you guys next week, same time at 530. Jimmy, do you have any uh, final, final words of wisdom for us? You know, I do. It's long live the soil. Uh, trademarked right you bet it's trademarked and and i mean it because it it better because we gotta have it and we need to protect it uh god give us this great resource uh to to live on and, and to foster it and we're here to take care of it and so long live it love it all right keith thank you you guys have a great rest of your evening and we'll see you all next week thanks everybody